Some years ago, I went to visit a friend of mine who is an evangelical. And my friend showed me a little book, a book that had a story about an American child who was involved in a motor accident, apparently died, went to heaven, and came back to life here on earth. So in heaven, this little boy saw Jesus, he saw God the Father, he even saw the Blessed Virgin Mary. And my friend was trying to say to me, this is proof that this is a, a true story because which evangelical would see the Virgin Mary in heaven? So the little boy also saw his grandparents, his great-grandparents. The story was very descriptive. Now, being a Jesuit, I was very skeptical about this story. But to be polite, I did not say this to my friend. Anyhow, some years later, I heard that the boy had repudiated this story. He had said the story was a work of fiction. It was written by his father, who had exclusive rights to the, to the book, and who had made quite a bit of money off it, so it sold you know, millions of copies. And it turns out that this kind of, of book is actually quite, quite common in some Christian circles that some Christians claim they have died and gone to heaven and visited over there and then come back to life. And they tend to make quite a bit of money off it. Sometimes they make movies and TV series off of these stories. So for my part, I remain quite skeptical about, about such stories. Um, I think some of them really are a hoax. I think some of them are maybe the result of a dreamlike experience um, people have and think that they have actually been to heaven. And my skepticism is because these stories tell us nothing new about heaven. In fact, they merely confirm what we believe heaven to be like. And so often they'll have choirs of angels, they'll have um, stories about, you know, people dressed in white, uh, stor stor you know, ideas that we receive from mostly the book of Revelation. And often there's no evidence that the person who says they died actually died. There's no medical evidence to, to suggest that they actually ever died. Now, I say this because the story of the resurrection of Jesus might seem like a hoax. And we might want to ask ourselves, well, why should we believe this story? Just like the stories of these people who claim to have died and gone to heaven, maybe the story of Jesus rising from the dead never happened. And it's a serious question because People who are not Christians, our contemporaries who are atheists or belong to other religions, they'll say, Jesus never rose from the dead. This story is quite possibly a hoax. And if it's a hoax, then we are deluded as Christians. We believe something which is not true. For me, one of the more important reasons to believe that Jesus really rose from the dead is to see the fruits of the resurrection in the disciples. The first fruit in the disciples was faith. So the resurrection made the disciples believe that Jesus Christ truly is divine. He is the Son of God. And what's extraordinary is that they did not benefit from this belief. Unlike the people who make money off saying that they have been to heaven, who make movies and uh, write, write books about it, the disciples didn't get anything, any benefit out of telling the story that Jesus rose from the dead. In fact, they suffered for it. They were beaten up, they were imprisoned, and they were killed for this belief. But they kept believing and they kept spreading the news that Jesus had risen from the dead. And so through a chain of witnesses, from the disciples down to us, even down to me, coming from Africa, we receive this news, the wonderful news that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. That death does not have the final say. 
The second fruit is quite similar to the first fruit, and it is the fruit of hope. So the resurrection of Jesus Christ produces hope in the disciples that they have seen Jesus rise from the dead and go to eternal life. So there's a promise for them too, and for us, that when we die, we shall rise again, that we shall go and live an eternal life with, with God and Jesus and all the saints and all the people that we loved. So I mentioned two fruits. The first is faith, the second is hope, and so the third must be charity. And charity, I think, is the most important of all the fruits that we see in the disciples. In the first reading from the Acts of the Apostles, we see the disciples do something extraordinary. They sell everything that they own, and they give their possessions to the apostles to distribute amongst them. Now, if you think about it, would you ever sell all that you own and have it shared amongst people who are not part of your family? I think almost no one would do that. However, at least one person here I know has done that, and that is me. And okay, what I've done is not unusual because to join religious life, to be a Jesuit or a Franciscan or, or a Benedictine or a Dominican, you have to sell everything and give it to the poor and join a community in which whatever I earn, whatever everyone else earns, goes into one pot. And then we share it as people need. So we do not have anything that belongs to us. So we live a life very similar to the life of the first Christians, a life of giving everything away and sharing amongst ourselves. And that is one way to understand charity, as a way to be sharing, to take from our resources and to give to those who need them. The disciples, as we read in the Acts of the Apostles, continue the work of charity that they saw Jesus doing. They heal the sick, they feed the hungry, they console the afflicted. They forgive sinners. They do what they saw Jesus doing. They continue the work of charity. They show that the life of Jesus was worth living. And it was also worth dying for. That what Jesus did, we also ought to do. And so for me, this is the clearest sign that Jesus really rose from the dead. And even if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, let's say, by some chance I discover after my, my own death that it was a hoax, that Jesus never really rose from the dead. I still say it was worth living my life in this way, living a life of, of charity, a life of sharing, because that's the best kind of life. It's a life that benefits everyone, not just myself. On this Sunday of the Divine Mercy, I'd like us to reflect on one kind of charity that I think is maybe the highest form of charity, and that is mercy forgiveness. When Jesus appears to Sister Faustina, he reveals to her that he has a tender heart of mercy. And we see that Jesus is merciful throughout his ministry on earth. He spends time with sinners. He forgives them. And so, because we see Jesus doing that, we know that when we come to Jesus to say, forgive me, Jesus always forgives. There's never a time Jesus says, oh no, your sin is so big, I'm not going to forgive you. No, Jesus forgives all sins. And so in our turn, we must show mercy towards other people, the people we call sinners. So there's indeed a time to condemn evil. When we see something wrong happening, we should condemn it. Today, when we see what's going on in Gaza, when we see what's going on in Ukraine, or Sudan, or Yemen, or the inner cities of America, we should condemn the violence that we are witnesses to, and we should work for peace. This is a very important witness of our faith. When we're baptized, we're baptized to be priests, to be kings, to be prophets. And to be a prophet means to, to condemn the powerful when they oppress the weak, to denounce the rich, when they exploit the poor, that is part of what it means to be a Christian, to be prophetic. However, we should be careful not to use our faith 
the fact that we are Christians to beat people we call sinners. We should be careful not to use our faith to deepen the divisions that exist in our society or to intensify the exclusion that some people suffer. Today, some Christians will pick a particular group, a group they will call sinners. And we begin to bash them, we begin to condemn them. We say what you're doing is so wrong that you don't deserve salvation. But it should be obvious to us that Jesus never took this approach. The only people that Jesus ever condemned were the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious authorities who thought that they were better than everyone else. They would point fingers at people and say, you are sinners, you are sinners, you are sinners. And they thought of themselves as the righteous people. In contrast to these self-righteous people, Jesus loved everyone. In the Gospels, we see Jesus very, spending quite a bit of time with sinners, with tax collectors, with prostitutes. People that every decent person would say, I will never associate with. But Jesus spent time with them. Jesus dined with them. He embraced them to the point that the Pharisees and Sadducees began to say, oh, this fellow here is a drunkard. <coughs> Jesus is a, um, a glutton and a friend of tax collectors and sinners. It is obvious that Jesus loved all sinners. He, he, he loved even the Roman centurion who had a sick servant. So this centurion was the very symbol of oppression. He was a, a powerful person who was oppressing the Jewish people. But Jesus tries to find good even in the powerful oppressor. Jesus tries to find good even in the rich people who exploit others. He tries to find good in everyone so that he can convert us. I'm certain that Jesus loved Pontius Pilate, who sentenced him to death. I'm sure Jesus loved the chief priests and the religious authorities who denounced him on false charges. How do I know this? Because on the cross, Jesus says, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. And so from these examples, we can realize that the mercy of Jesus is not exclusive to us Christians. It extends to all people, people of all faiths and those without faith. The mercy of God is not exclusive to those who share our political or moral views. The mercy of God extends to everyone, even to those we call our enemies. The mercy of God is not exclusive to those who have a good family life. The mercy of God extends to those who have a difficult family life, to those who suffer divorce and separation, to those who suffer domestic violence, to those who have to deal with financial troubles and who are tempted to commit crime. And the mercy of, of God is not exclusive to those who keep the sixth commandment. The mass of Jesus extends to, and I think in a very special way, to those who struggle with that commandment, who see in the way of Jesus, who, when we see Jesus um, in his life, he defends prostitutes and other fallen women. And so we know that even those who sin against the sixth commandment are loved by, by Jesus. And I'm quite certain that Jesus extends his love and mercy to those who struggle with their sexuality and with their gender. The divine mercy truly is, is for everyone. So when we feel tempted to condemn someone as a sinner, it might be worthwhile to ask ourselves, first of all, do I love this person? Would I be willing to be a friend to this person? And can I show this person mercy? And to each of these questions, Jesus would say, yes, 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 I love this person. 
Yes, I want to be a friend to this person. And yes, I want to show my mercy to this person who is a sinner. So Jesus goes way beyond and says to the people we call sinners, I love you so much that I have died for you. Thank you for joining us today. Our digital ministry provides a valuable service to parishioners and visitors alike. How wonderful that we can share God's word, the celebration of the Eucharist, and other important words and events with those who may not be able to be with us in person. If you would like to support this effort, please go to olphglenview.org. Click on the gold donate button and then the Sunday giving icon to make a contribution on our secure online giving portal. We sincerely appreciate your past and ongoing support. Thank you for helping us continue this ministry. God bless. Thank you.